Um, I just want to take a moment to extend my, a very warm welcome to you all, for, uh, those who are visiting our YouTube channel. Uh, it could be for the first time, um, uh, whether you're back again, uh, we just want to say you're welcome. If you are searching for something and you happen just to maybe jump into our message, just have five or ten minutes to listen to the message and you'll be blessed by something. God has got something for you. May God bless you as you are able to hear the word of God, especially at this moment. God bless you all. Let us listen to God's prayer, word through prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything. We come with our heart and mind to worship God together in this place. Whether we feel bruised or triumphant, sad or joyful, let us lift our hands to praise you, God. Let us lift our hearts to you, God. You are the center of everything. Let us draw closer to you, the almighty God, focusing on God's voice. Let us take time to slow our minds and open our hearts in preparation to receive what God wants us to give us today. Let us drop the mask we wear and be honest before God and one another. In Jesus' name we come and in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I would call my brother Ben to come and read the word of God, um, which is coming from the book of Mark chapter 7, uh, verses 1 to 23. Good morning, everyone, and praise the Lord, and I uh, pray that you're all well, mm -hmm. and uh, you're, you're having that relationship with God. I, I just uh, call out to you is to just sort of pray for those in lockdown and... Uh, even if you're in lockdown, pray for other other people in lockdown. It must be an incredible trial. Like where I live, it's uh, been an amazing uh, COVID experience. We've all had barely any COVID around, but there's a lot of people probably suffering, especially uh, Sydney and Melbourne at the moment with all these lockdowns. So just 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 have a quick prayer for them. I encourage you anyway. But uh, as Johnson mentioned. Um, Mark 7, 1 to 23 and it's about Jesus teaches about inner purity the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with their hands that were defiled this is unwashed the Pharisees and all of the Jews did not eat unless they gave their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observed many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders? instead of eating their food with defiled hands, instead eating their food with defiled hands. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, their teaching are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your, your own traditions. For Moses said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, 
that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you even... Uh, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, uh, the evil thoughts come sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these come from inside and defile a person. This is the word of the Lord for this week. And a uh, great verse. It's a challenging verse for each one of us. So we'll get Johnson back to challenge us some more with his word this week. I can't wait. So come with open ears. Thank you, Johnson. I'm back again. This morning I've decided to share with you on a theme, the heart's deceit. The heart's deceit. When I read this passage, I've been thinking about something, uh, especially with regard to traditionalism. Traditionalism is the living religion of the dead or the dead religion of the living. Tradition imagines that nothing worthwhile will ever again be done for the first time or because everything worth doing has already been done. Therefore, traditionalism repeats what it imagined always was and was imagined always will be. So the problem with tradition for tradition's sake is a terminal case of spiritual heart disease. People who strongly oppose all tradition are misguided, sometimes also. Good tradition gives us a sense of time and a place, home base. Religious tradition helps us understand who we are. Great traditions shine a spotlight on God's way, move us to obedient service and help our hearts seeing the joy of freedom in Christ. They should explain and reinforce the teachings of God, not be the screens that block out the light. So God's word should always be the focus and not our tradition. And tradition means of making that word lively. So we need to celebrate our tradition with the prayer that Christ will be exalted. Change your tradition when it becomes king or when it amplifies the subject for God's word. That's when you say, no, 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 no. We need to change if it is a tradition. So in this scripture reading, a delegation of religious leaders make their way from Jerusalem to investigate Jesus Christ, just as they had done previously. In Mark 3, verse 22, the last time they came, they called Jesus an instrument of the devil. This time they observed some of Jesus' disciples eating food without first washing their hands. And they are saying, why are your disciples doing this? So the gospel writer of Mark, whose target audience is the Romans, explains for his intended readers the Pharisaical tradition. It is no pre-surgical scrub of the Pharisee practice when they wash their hands. They merely pour water over their hands and then dry them out with a cloth. Nevertheless, being seen going through the ritual is very important to them because the tradition of ceremonial washing was passed down orally from one generation to another. The next, maybe for a thousand years. Originally, this washing began because the Pharisees of old felt a need to rid themselves of any defilement 
that might have occurred when they have conduct with the dead Gentiles when they visit the marketplace. So for men, cultural tradition has become the master. Tradition is the only reason they keep repeating some things. They practice their traditions even when those traditions hold them back from becoming what they are designed to be and what they can be. Life as they know it, with all its traditions, is leaving them behind. The same is true for the Pharisees. Before we criticize the Jews for their traditions, however, let us remember that there are some people in the Christian church who also are trapped in tradition's names. Ask them and they tell you that they do not always know why they are doing these things. They do expect that they inherited their practices and believe things have always been done that way. Worship is aimed when the rules of men are substituted for the word of God. Sometimes we do it without even thinking. So it is with the Pharisees who came to keep an eye on Jesus. Jesus, however, is more than a match for them. He tells them that the quasi religious rituals have placed their relationship with God. So like men, they are slaves to their own tradition. Jesus says the problem is not in their action, but in their hearts. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In verse 6, that is what Jesus says. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. So what does Jesus say? So the biggest heart problem in the church in our generation cannot be better by any cardiologist prescription. The heart's biggest problem is that it does not always follow what God says in his way. So it cheats itself and those with whom it comes into contact. This is the problem that Jesus sees in the Pharisees. He sees that they've got a problem with the hard thing. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law ask Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? Mark 7 verse 5. No one knows better than Jesus that the Pharisees took the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses and on Mount Sinai and so intertwined them with their own cultural rituals that even the ten laws of God had become 4,000 religious ordinances. Men designed to trap the people. Yes, they robbed the people of God a right relation with God. The Pharisees passed these edits from one generation of their sect to the next of 4,000 years and nobody could know for sure where each law came from. Some religious leaders today still rules, add rules and regulation to God's word, causing much confusion among believers. I've seen that the church has got, which is, we, I'm not saying it's bad, we've got what we call maybe code of ethics, we've got what we call standing orders, a basis of union, but sometimes people put these ones in the pedestal so that now the word of God cannot be seen. We now worship all these things it is idolatry to claim that your interpretation of God's word is, is more important as God's word itself. It is idolatry that my preaching is more than God's word. It is especially dangerous to set up extra biblical standards for others to follow and give standards equal authority with the Bible. It is that you look Christ for guidance about your own behavior and let him lead others in the details of their lives. Among them was a notion that whatever tied the hands was unclean and eventually absorbed in the skin to corrupt the whole body. Therefore, when Jesus' disciples eat without observing the ceremonial hand washing ritual, the Pharisees considered them heinous lawbreakers because they ate without washing their hands. So it is interesting that in making his response, Jesus does not try to explain or justify the disciples' failure to wash their hands. Instead, as he did once before when he was tempted by Satan in the desert in Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 10, Jesus speaks about the only source of true authority. The written word of God, the time he applies Isaiah's inspired record. Isaiah was right when he prophesies about you hypocrites as it is written. These people
people honor me with their lips and their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and holding on to the traditions of men in Mark chapter 7, verse 6 to 8. That is what Jesus is saying. The human heart has always had the capacity to extend and twist God's way and rearrange it. We see it first in the Garden of Eden when Eve exaggerated God's direction to the first couple. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Genesis 3, verse 2 to 3. God has said nothing about touching the tree, only that they must not eat it. In Genesis 2, verse 17. So the unredeemed heart left to his own devices who inevitably twist God's word into a noose for his own neck and cheat, his own honor of God's best for life. So the only way to avoid cheating heart is to know God's word and leave it out. Do you know God's word? When you know God's word, then you are able to say, no, 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 no. What is being said is not what the Bible says. And now you are able to practice it inside and outside the church when you know the word of God. It's not only that you hear it inside the church. You are able to practice it, to, to put it into practice inside and even outside the church because you know the word of God. So the concealing heart, the second problem, these Pharisees have is the same problem that Pharisees had in every generation, even this one. They imagine themselves to be something they are not. Jesus used a very powerful name to expose them. You hypocrites. The Greek word for hypocrite means to act as part or to pretend. Hippo. And crete. Secretly. In short, Jesus calls the Pharisees pretenders. No matter how sincere they and their religious rituals them on surface, they are male play actors. Jesus tell them, you are just actors. So there are two lessons for us here. For we must see that simply saying the right way does not constitute true spiritual worship. Jesus quoting Isaiah says, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. One may attend the service of the church, sing the songs of the church, in faith recite the creeds, partake the sacraments, Listen to the sermons, yet still not belong to Christ. That can happen. This is a hard thing for a minister to say, but we remember Nicodemus and Saul of Tarsus, both of whom were regarded as religious leaders before their own people. Yet both of them spiritually disconnected from what God was doing about in Jesus' life. They were all disconnected. It is an old saying, yet it is true. Being in the church does not make someone a Christian any more than being in a garage makes one a car. Only the redemptive work of Christ on Calvary's cross can make us true followers of Jesus. So Jesus uses these words to arrest Nicodemus. I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. In John 3 verse 3. So the second truth brought home in Christ's reply is found in Mark 7. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men, not from God. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. In verse 7, 8. Mark 7, verse 7, 8. Nor is this better illustrated than in Mark 14, verse 1. It says, now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. The Bible they read tells, do not kill. 
But we are hearing that they were planning secretly to kill Jesus, to murder him. They knew this word, but they were not putting it into practice. So that's why Jesus was saying, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Despite all their strict adherence to the rituals, they had completely forgotten about God's commands not to murder. Jesus accused these leaders of rejecting God's commands even as they kept their own traditions. Yes, they were keeping their traditions, but they have forgotten about God. That is the difference between theism and meism. We either worship God for God's sake or worship God for our sake. The fact that we attend a certain church and live feeling good does not necessarily guarantee that we worship in that church pleases God. It doesn't mean that when you worship in a certain church, what you are doing pleases God. It just means that you are liking what is happening there. Real worship is not measured by how it pleases me, but by how it measures up to God's standards. How does it measure up to God's word? That is what true worship is. Today we use the term seeker sensitive to define certain styles of worship. We must be alert to the inherent danger in this approach to worship. In our desire to be seeker sensitive, we must be careful to remember that our primary focus is not on the seekers, but on the Savior. The Lord of the church. Who is the Lord of the church? We dare not dilute the scriptural elements of worship just to please a crowd. We are not to please people, we are to please God. We are not to entertain people, we are to please God. It is more of God than entertainment. True worship focuses only on Jesus. To promote the seeker over God is a direct violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. In Exodus 20 verse 3. So which means, first place needs to be given to God only. The only way to be God is to become God's in, in God's own way. So because the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful. You don't know what I'm thinking. You, I don't know what you are thinking. I don't know what you are going through. I don't know what you will be doing later on. The heart is deceitful beyond all things. Beyond cure. It is possible, as the Pharisees often demonstrate, to believe in our heart that we are serving God and be dead wrong. We might be telling people that we are serving God, but we are doing the wrong thing. But there is hope. God's promise. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward the man according to his conduct, according to what he did deserve. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. That is what he said. So when we genuinely come through Christ's cross, we all are and if God meets us and cleanses us our concealing heart. So when we meet Christ, it is only through the blood of Christ that it cleanses our unclean heart. The things that could not be seen. And because we are doing these things, we need to have a confessing heart. Where we come one on one with God and confess our sins. From within, out of many's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lawlessness, envy, slander, arguing, arrogance, folly. And these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. They came from within. And these are the ones that make a man unclean. Mark 7, verse 21 to 23. So what Jesus observed in the Pharisees we see in our day in the Taliban. Look what is happening in Af Afghanistan. But wait, do we not also in many places see it in the church that bears Jesus' name? <laughs> Even in our churches, we see it every day. The heart of the matter real is the heart of the matter because the heart is the final, the source mirror. When the heart is right with God, then the life is right with God. And James says, sometimes we see ourselves in the mirror. And then when we walk out, we forget who we are. The moment we leave church buildings, we forget who we are as Christians. 
We are only Christians at church. And when we leave the church buildings, we forget who we are. And that is true. And I agree with what James says. We forget who we are. So contrasting what the Pharisees told Jesus says that it is not what we see on the outside, but what proceeds from inside that tells us who we really are. That comes from inside. We are created from the inside out, not as the Pharisees taught from the outside in. The Pharisees only thought of washing their hands outside. They never thought of what about the inside. What's happening in you? On one hand, if someone's life is characterized by evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lawlessness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, then there is a serious, eternally fatal spiritual heart problem here. There is a serious problem in our lives. On the other hand, if someone's life is characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23, then the heart belongs to Christ. <laughs> that heart belongs to Christ. The evidence of the spirit fruit are indicators of a healthy spirit. I heart is showing something of the person. And we don't need only a confessing heart. We need a heart that is consecrated to Christ. A consecrated heart. That's the heart we are also in need of. It is fine like the difference between religion and relation that Christ addresses with the Pharisees. So the word religion is from a Latin root meaning to keep on repeating the same ritual. The Pharisees had a religion. They did the same meaningless actions repeatedly and thoughtlessly. Christ, on the other hand, invites us into relationship with the Father and himself. The relationship is connecting or binding a spirit that joins people as they are one. Jesus invites us to bind our heart to his heart that we may be one for the Father's glory. Your heart is now consecrated to Christ. You have given your heart to Christ. You have surrendered your heart to Christ. There is nothing you are hiding from him. He is to answer those who echo David's prayer in Psalm 51 verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Can you see something of that nature happen in your life? For everyone who makes that their prayer, he promises, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. In Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. I will remove from their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. If today your heart is divided, come to him with all your heart, to him who can give a new heart. Amen to that church. Come to, if you feel your heart is divided, come to Jesus Christ so that he can give you a new heart. The cure. The good news of the gospel offers the cure of humanity's natural development. Cleansing can only come by the blood of Jesus offered on behalf. Only then can we become pure before God. We need cleansing. And how do we get the cleansing of our heart? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it comes to us, to every believer, to everyone, to every Christian, to every follower of Christ, who consecrate their heart to Christ, who submit their life to Christ, who surrender their life to Christ, is there to cleanse them. So I'm saying, brothers and sisters, it's high time we surrender our heart to only the living Son of God, the Alpha and Omega of your life, who is Jesus Christ. He is there to help you. No matter what you are going through, He is there to, to support you, to lead you, to walk with you. Please, it's time for you to surrender your heart to Christ. Your heart needs a surgery, spiritual surgery. And Jesus is ready to perform it right now. Surrender it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we thank you. We live in an unjust world. We live in a world that is now rotten. We, need in a world, we live in a world that needs forgiveness. Forgive us, Lord. When we play act our faith, not letting your word sink in us, putting our traditions above the word of God. Father, help us. Sometimes we may reciting what sounds good without acknowledging the ugliness in our hearts. Peel away the layers of hypocrisy in our lives and bring us into all revealing light of your presence. Help us to live our lives as a reflection of your grace and glory that others may find us a genuine witness to our amazing gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers, and sisters, I urge you, now it's time to give our offerings. You might be new to this, but always we need to say thank you to God. So, after hearing the word of God, I feel obliged just to encourage you. And also, we feel obliged to say thank you, God. So bring your offerings now so that I can pray for you. As you are holding your offerings wherever you are, I'll be praying for your offerings. Lord Jesus, as we bring our offerings wherever we are, Father, thank you that you are the only one we come to and we want to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of heart, life. Thank you that you have placed a new heart in our lives that is aligned with the word of God. The heart that is consecrated to you. The heart that knows who to give. The heart that loves everyone unconditionally. Father, receive our offerings. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We come to you as we go with the word of God in our hearts, praying that we embody it in our lives. And be true witness to our great hope. Help us, Holy Spirit, to keep in step with you and to grow more like you, Jesus, every day. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. <laughs>